Yes, introduce me again. It, it gives me great pleasure for the yes. first time in over two years to uh, introduce our chairman, Robin Schedule, at a live meeting in Thank South Harrow. Indeed. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it was uh, in this room where we had our, I was at the last meeting, so I knew the way to come anyway. Um, today, this is a meeting which we've been planning for quite some time, as you can see by the array of telescopes around you, and we are hoping that there will be a good recording of this because um, it's something that I think will last for quite a while, as the description of all the different types of telescopes that we have around. And we've got a wonderful array of telescopes. I think I brought too many myself, but, uh, because there are uh, equivalents here as well. But I've done to start with a 15 minute or so video <clears throat> about the types of telescopes we're going to look at. I'm just going to run through the things which you probably all know, but nevertheless uh, may need reminding of. <clears throat> and then we will look at individual telescopes and the people who own them will explain why they bought them, what they can do, and uh, why, they, why they like them, or maybe not, what the pros and cons are. So the aim is to show you the different types of telescope that you can buy and, and mounts available. And really, you can't just, just um, uh, discriminate between telescopes and mounts, because as you can see, they all are on um, different kinds of mountings, and uh, how you use them, their pros and cons. Types of telescope, we should get to... Just a little bit. I've just pulled Right, there, there, we go. there we go, it's all on the screen now. <clears throat> well, as you know, there are refractors, and this is an example of a refracting telescope with a lens at the top. And there are reflectors, and here's an example of a reflecting telescope with a mirror at the bottom, and usually, in many cases, a mirror to reflect sideways the light, and there is where the light comes out, and you can either put your eye an eyepiece or a camera, <coughs> so the reflectors, and there's catadioptric telescopes, of which this is an example here, and uh, they're divided into Maksutov and Schmidt Cassegrains. Now I've got a Schmidt Cassegrain down on the floor there, I haven't had a chance to put it on its, on its stand, but uh, we can uh, do that if we need to. And right now the different types uh, of mounting, uh, there's Altazimuth, where uh, there are again a wide range of different possibilities and we will we've got good examples of each of them here and there are equatorials which again there's a wide variety of different types right refractors and as i say there's a lens at one end or in fact not a single lens usually but a combination of lenses and there's a, a eyepiece at the other end and i'll mention the reason for this in a minute <clears throat> and the light goes through the telescope once and then out at the end where there's an eyepiece. All telescopes need an eyepiece, with a couple of exceptions, which I'll mention right at the end. <clears throat> the, it's a bit small, but I'll read you what it says. The advantage of refractors is that they are that they're easy to use, it's exactly what you would expect to do. In other words, you point the telescope at what you want, what you want to see, and up there, and you look through the end, and that's straightforward. They're also quite robust because the lenses and the whole tube is pretty well fixed. There's no reason why ever why you should take it to bits and need to move things around. So the fixings here are usually pretty permanent and they don't go out of alignment. So they are quite robust as well. Um, they can withstand a reasonable amount of, of rough treatment being shoved under the bed for 20 years and then suddenly brought out and hey they work still so there is something to be said for refractors a lot to be said for refractors they provide high contrast images with a good field of view this wasn't really generally appreciated until we started putting cameras on the end because people who um who, who are interested in planetary photography and a lot of the time you're just interested in planets you don't need a wide field of view but refractors do have a good field of view Fairly, fairly wide, wider in fact of good quality than an equivalent reflector. I think it's true to say, people may disagree. Um, they are less prone to um, internal thermal effects than reflectors who can be used quickly. The light goes through the tube once and it is uh, 
often said that refractor you can take out of your uh, living room and set it up and within a fairly short space of time it's ready to use. Not quite true, it still needs to settle down to the ambient temperature but um, it is more so than in the case of reflectors. Now, a few cons in red, not seem so well. It can have awkward observing positions, hence the use of the star diagonal. Now, if you can imagine trying to get your eye right down here, and if you, even if you have a really large telescope, um, particularly if you have a really large telescope, which, unless you have an enormous tripod, the eyepiece is going to be quite low down. So that's why you need this star diagonal to bring the light out to one side. One snag, as soon as you put something through a mirror, it gets laterally inverted. So you look at the moon, and it's completely different from what you can see through binoculars, where the light comes straight through. And that does cause problems when you're trying to identify a star field and the, the nebulae, the obvious object you want. You have to start inverting everything uh, in order to see it, work out which way you need to move the telescope to find an object uh, by star hopping. They are expensive in large sizes. This is, uh, well, a six inch. Yeah. Yep. Um, and a six inch reflector might cost you, oh, a uh, couple of hundred quid. This is a lot more. How much was it? That one, I think, was about 900. 900, just a tube. Just a tube. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a two element one, a three element equivalent to 7,000. Right, yeah. So, um, and uh, this is where we come on to. Essentially, uh, achromatic reflectors, despite their names, do have false colour, chromatic aberration. Now, this is a problem that you get with particularly cheap instruments and budget instruments. As an example here that I brought along, this, this one here. Um, I, I, I was given this as a demo and it's been with me for years. It works tolerably well, but it's just got a pair of lenses, as you can see on the, uh, on, on the example there. Not a single lens. That would be, that is only cheap toy telescopes that you sell for 10.99 in in, uh, in in on on the market stalls, and they say refractor, uh, refracting telescope, and it's uh, it's for kiddies only really, but um, most telescopes have at least a, a double it there, two two lenses, and this one gives a reasonably good field of view, um, a, a full, full, um, view without false colour, as I'll show you in a, a minute. Um, more expensive are the fluorite instruments. Have we got a fluorite or, or an ED telescope here? This, is, this blue one, long blue one, is an ED. This one here yes. is an ED. You can't tell the difference just by looking at the tube, but instead of, they've still got two lenses, but one of them is made of what's called extra dispersion glass, which means that the, the more expensive glass counteracts that false colour more than just a, a simple pair of uh, fairly ordinary bits of glass. And ED refract, re refractors are pretty good. And then you go get acrochromatic reflector, refractors, which in general have got three lenses, and they are very highly corrected, and also very expensive, and often have particularly wide fields of view. So the apo difference in price between an, an acrochromatic for, for a 120mm telescope, which I just took because of the, I could get figures for all of them, an achromatic one, a simple one like that, costs £349, £350. An ED, like that one there, that's 100, but that's between about 120mm, would cost you, instead of 350 would cost you over £1,400. And a fully achromatic refractor of the same size will cost you 2599 so you can see there's a lot of that those the, the, the name of the reflector, the, the type of lens, makes a lot of difference to the price. And here's some here are examples. Now the Skywatcher 80mm ED refractor gives a pretty good view of the moon, not significant amounts of false colour. <clears throat> this telescope which I've got here, I took exactly the same picture on the same night, and it gave, as you see. There is false colour, it's sort of apple colour and, and magenta, which often you get. That's a reasonably good compare, comparison, uh, 
whatever different uh, colours to go for. But you can see that the detail is not as good. It's smeared out by the false colour. And this is a much cheaper one, a Bresser Skylux 80mm refractor. And that sort of um, bright blue and bright yellow false colour. And the, the detail isn't all that much different. In fact, you might argue it's slightly better than that one. But in general, um, achromatic refractors, just ordinary achromatic reflectors, despite their name, without colour, they have actually got quite a lot of false colour. And the more you magnify the image, the worse the false colour. Now, reflectors are, as I said, mirror down the bottom and the uh, secondary mirror to reflect the light that way um, through to the eyepiece. They are completely free from this false colour problem because mirrors reflect all colours equally. So that's one of their great advantages. Another advantage is they can be made in more or less any size and large apertures are not excessively expensive. You can get a, well we've got a, a 12 inch uh, reflector, reflector here, Dobsonian reflector, cost, oh, um, I think they're about sort of... Uh, 1900 that one. 1900. About 1200 if it's not computerised. Uh, oh, okay, 1200 for just a basic push-pull version. Whereas uh, a 12 inch refractor that's a, a major observatory jobby, and very few uh, amateurs would ever bother to have one. They are they're fiendishly expensive, you know, into the many tens of thousands for a 12-inch refractor of that size, with not enormous difference in performance. The 12-inch the, uh, Northumberland reflector, uh, refractor at Cambridge, for example, a venerable old instrument, that is an enormous thing. Um, and it takes a huge dome about, the size, well, maybe not the size of this room, but it, it's a different beast entirely. Good viewing position at the side of the tube. So, as you can see here, none of this crouching down and, and having things the wrong way around. You can actually look, at, look into the telescope fairly easily with whether it's high or low. Not a lot of problem there. And they rarely experience dewing up because the main mirror is right down at the bottom and it's exposed to a very little amount of sky. Whereas a refracting telescope, uh, or the catalytic like this one, you would find that, the, that the, uh, the glass is right at the top of the tube, so it's very prone to dewing up, no matter what you do. And you have to have dew, um, uh, dew tape and all that sort of thing to heat the lens uh, to stop it dewing up. The light path, however, um, is, is one problem because... The, uh, oh, the, the, the mirror coatings do deteriorate with age and so if you leave it under the bed for 20 years and there's a bit of damp in the room or out in the garage you'll come to it and find the spots all over the mirror and the spiders have got to it and it's very difficult to clean so the mirror coatings do deteriorate with age and this looked after very well indeed and very few of us do can look after them that well the off-axis images which by which I mean Things at the edge of the field of view can show coma, particularly at, at, with a wide field eyepiece, low magnification. Uh, by coma, I mean that the edges of the stars at the edge aren't points of light, but they show a little sort of comet-like appearance, all usually pointing in towards the centre of the field of view. It's not very, uh, very good for observing stars. It doesn't matter for planets, which are right in the middle of the field of view, but for wide fields of stars, the wide field of a Newtonian reflector is not all that good. For most purposes it's, it's fine, but it is a problem that happens. Um, the light path is more sensitive to misalignment and tube currents because you've got one mirror, two mirrors, and each of them could be adjusted. You might, they are designed usually to be removable so that when the coating does need to be replaced or recoated, then they can be uh, put back in the tube and what's more, the light is travelling through the tube once, twice. So any slight thermal imbalance inside the tube affects the, the, uh, the light path. And they are more susceptible to tube currents and thermal effects, which means that you can't take them out and just start observing usually. They have to settle down to the ambient temperature. <clears throat> and the fact that there is a, 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 a secondary mirror in the light path, or as in the case of this one, uh, you can see here quite a large spot in the middle of the field of view. That reduces the micro contrast of objects, so they are not necessarily as good for planetary work, where you want to get the maximum contrast as a refractor of the equivalent size. 
And um, so there are pros and cons of reflectors as well. Finally, a catadioptric, and I was using that as an example there. <clears throat> they combine a mirror and a, I put lens in quote marks there, it's actually a corrector plate at the top of the field. In this case, it's a, a flat plate, pretty well flat. You look at it, it looks like it's a flat bit of glass, but it has got a slight uh, figure on it. And that corrects the light going through. The, the mirror is cheap to make because it's just a spherical mirror, the simplest kind of mirror you can make. But the corrector plate is, is quite expensive to make. And the secondary mirror, not necessarily fixed to the corrector there, but um, it, it, is, it is at the top there. <clears throat> and that is also a, a bit more difficult to make than, uh, the, the, than a flat mirror. Um, they are two different types. The schmidt tassegrain of which I've got an example down here, which I haven't had a chance to put on its, on its mounting. I think I can just lift it up for you and show you. I'll just put it on its base there. <laughs> My microphone lead has got caught round gubbins. Now if we look at this, see it's got a pretty well flat glass and that's the Schmidt Cassegrain it's not flat but it looks pretty flat there have a look at it afterwards and the central obstruction as you can see there is quite large the other type is the Maksutov of which we've got two examples this ETX here I don't know if you can see very well, well enough but um, the, uh, is the is the clutch off let me just can I turn it? Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, can you see it's slightly dished? You can see it, it's quite a concave mirror on the inside. And that means that um, it's a Maksutov. And the secondary is actually coated onto the inside of the corrector plate. Yeah. Maksutovs typically have an F number, which we haven't come on to, of about F, uh, F14, which is very, gives you a very long focal length for the size of the tube and Schmidt Cassegrain is normally about F10 and as you can see they're very stubby tubes compared with say this. This is an F14 telescope and gives you very high long focal length by very high magnifications compared with the uh, with the reflecting telescope uh, just as where uh, the tube is quite long for equivalent focal length. Now, that means that they are particularly good for, as I say, high magnifications, and therefore particularly useful for planetary work or for observing um, a uh, maybe planetary nebulae and so on, which are very small, and galaxies as well, small objects, rather than wide fields of view, where something like this really holds sway. More expensive than Newtonian of the same aperture, so an 8-inch uh, Newtonian might cost you... Oh, 250 pounds on a uh, on the Dobsonian mount, whereas an 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain will probably cost you about 1,500. Um, prone to thermal currents for the same reason: the light's coming into the tube, then going back to the secondary, and then out again. So it's got three tra three passes through the uh, through the tube. So you might have to let it set down, settle down for quite a while. It's focused by moving the mirror up and down the tube. You might think it's focused here by just twisting up in and out, but it's not. The main mirror is moved up and down the tube, and it's held at one end on the threaded rod. And as you turn it, there tends to be a certain amount of backlash, and the mirror can twist from one side to the other, which has the effect that you're observing Jupiter. You think, oh, I can tweak the photograph, uh, the, the focus of this, and you turn the focusing knob ever so slightly, and it zooms across the field of view, and maybe out of the field of view. So in a badly made Category, that can be a problem. Now, altazimuth mount mountings. Altazimuth mountings go side to side and up and down. And here's a good example, side to side, up and down. That's the same sort of thing there. And we've got a very cheap one here. This is what's known as an AZ3 type mounting. It's, it's quite robust, just a, a couple of slow, motion, slow motions there to, to move on either way. It's actually not a bad telescope if you just want to have something grab and go. The very cheap ones are 
pretty pretty rickety. But it's worth if you're going to get a telescope on an altazimuth mount, it's worth getting something which is reasonably uh, reasonably solid and potentially simple to use and stable with no counterweights needed, which I'll come on to in a minute. Quick to set up with computerized control can be made to track objects, although alignment is needed. In other words, if you want to have a go-to instrument, go-to telescopes need to know where everything is in the sky, and therefore they need to be aligned on the sky to start with before you can use them. And um, so alignment is, is going to be needed. And you can make them track objects with computer control. This will do that. Uh, we'll do it. This, will, this ETH will, will track an object once it knows where everything is. And that will, and the Schmidt category down there, will do that as well. But with something like this, this actually, you say, has got the, the gizmos on it to, yeah. uh, to, it to, to point at objects, but it won't track things because it yes. hasn't got motors on. These have all got motors and therefore need power. One of the advantages of not having uh, motors and batteries is that you don't have to worry about them running down. So you can observe this all night if, if you want to, and you just need to, use, to know the sky and use the finder to find objects. So altazimuths have limited manual control. In other words, you do need to be able to find objects in the sky for yourself unless you have one of the, uh, the go-to versions. And even with the driven computerized versions, um, imaging exposures are limited to about 15 seconds. So if you want to take pictures through them and you want to photograph, uh, do a long exposure, all you can do is, um, is take lots and lots of 15 second exposures and then add them after, one after another. The reason being is that as, the, as an object moves through the sky, say the moon, it starts over there, say, and it rises to maximum uh, height like that and then sets like that. Now you can see that my hands have rotated one compared with the other during the course of the night. And that's noticeable in a very short space of time, maybe half a minute, the field of view on an altazimuth telescope will rotate. <clears throat> so you have to keep the exposure times down to 15 seconds or thereabouts, unless you have a quite a complicated mirror rotating device in the tube. So a few examples, Skywatcher 102, <clears throat> refractor on an AZ3, like the one I've got here, £264. And that's, uh, that is a 102 millimetre refractor, isn't it? 100, that's 100. 100, well, it will take a... Um, so, on a simple mount, that will set you back £264, and, and we're talking about an achromatic telescope. Celestron Next Star 130, on a side arm go to. This is also an Altaz, but it's... Um, it's just got one arm holding the uh, holding the, the telescope, and it's got a, a go-to thing. So you need to align these on the on the sky first of all. And I think Tim will explain how it's done with this model. Um, and that will cost you four hundred and fifty pounds. I think those are good beginners telescopes, by the way, because they do find objects very 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 easily. All you have to do is to point them at three stars in the sky, tell them the date and where you are, and then they know where everything else is. So it's, it's quite an easy de device. Here's a Celestron, uh, this is a large Schmidt Cassegrain, the, the modern version of the one I've got down there. As you can see, it's, um, that will cost you £2,200, uh, and it's on an Altazimuth mounting. And um, then we have the Dobsonian, of which this is an example. Skywatcher 200p, that's 8-inch uh, Dobsonian, £369. So quite a lot cheaper than the one we have here, but that's just, this is just the, the basic uh, bog, bog standard dog, try saying that, and uh, that will cost you um, uh, 269 pounds, 369 pounds, whereas the, this is what a 12 inch version is, isn't it Stuart? Yes. Yeah. Now this is an innovation which has come along in the last few years. A, as I said, it's, it, it's quite tricky to find objects in the sky maybe with an Altazimuth mount. Celestron have called, they call this the Star Sense Explorer. It's a 70 millimeter achromatic telescope, you know, fairly basic telescope. But it's got a, a stand on the top, a, a mount on the top for your smartphone. It only costs 149 pounds. And what you do is use your smartphone. It looks into a mirror, which is that one there. 
and at the sky. And you've got to have a reasonably modern smartphone which will be able to show a few stars in the sky at night. And it recognises the stars. It's got GPS in the phone, of course. And it then is able to recognise the part of the sky. And at that point, it, it can actually direct you to where the object you want to find in its database. So what it does is you, you say, I'd like to go to the oh, Crab Nebula. And then arrows appear on the screen. And they point you to, and they get shorter and shorter until you're right on the object itself. So for £149, that is quite a clever idea to, to find objects. And people who've got them say they're wonderful. So that's a, a, a fairly good example of a go to, of a Altazimuth. It's not a driven telescope, you still need to push and pull, but um, it can find objects reasonably well. And the Skywatcher 130, AZGTI, £409. There's a little Wi-Fi symbol there. It looks a simple mounting, but it does have the ability to, to link to, your, to an app on your phone, a special app on your phone. And it has got motors, so it will drive to, to any part of the sky. That's the whole, for the whole thing. Uh, including a tripod and the 130mm refractor, uh, reflector. This is a 130, and I'll show you another 130 at the, the back here. This is a 130mm reflector. So you can see that this is what we used to call a 5-inch. Um, quite a reasonable size of telescope, and um, some, you, uh, this may be a 127, and that's a 127. 125, isn't it? 105. 105, right. But uh, nevertheless, a reasonable size of, of telescope. There's a lot to be said for a 130mm reflector or a uh, max or whatever because it's, it's, it's got quite a good light grasp and um, if you want a cheap telescope that will show you a lot of objects, about 130mm is quite a good option. Now, there is another type of Altazimuth telescope which, I, which has come along very recently and that's the smart telescope. This is, there are two types, both made in France, uh, designed and made in France. Automatic telescopes that set themselves up and plate solve to a line on the sky. Then they take repeated short exposures or rotate the field to prevent that field rotation business I told you about. Controlled via smartphone or tablet. And the price of the Unistellar EV scope, your Equinox, which is the cheapest, it's a 114mm reflector, £2,600. Wow! That's, for the same price, you can get, um, uh, uh, you, you get two of those, <laughs> but, um, which has got an enormous light grasp. But it's got no eyepiece. However, you can see the pictures it takes on your smartphone. And it literally, both of these telescopes, you literally put them down, they, because of your smartphone having GPS and so on, they know where they are on the ground and they look at a part of the sky, they take a picture with the inbuilt camera and recognise the star field, this is called plate solving, within about a minute. It's very easy these days for computer systems to do this. And, and then once they know that, they may look at another part of the sky and do the same thing again. And once they've done that, they know everything about what's in the sky, how the telescope is set up, where they are, and you can then tell it to go to whatever, whatever object is in its database or wherever you please, and tell it to give a five-minute, ten-minute exposure. And as you look on your phone, you find that the image is starting to build up. I've yet to use one of these, but it is apparently quite magical to see the image starting to build up from maybe just one or two stars and suddenly you get the galaxy appearing and all that sort of thing. And a colour image, image appears on your smartphone and you can share it with up to 10 friends and all that sort of thing. This is the more expensive version, not a 114mm reflector, but an 80mm reflector. And it costs €4,000, the Veonis Selina. And that is um, a, a, a rival, but this one, I think, has got the market because it's that much cheaper. Now, if you say, well, 114mm refractor for all that money, uh, just to take photographs, yes, I agree, but I've got a, an 80mm refractor that I use for, uh, I've shown you the pictures on uh, many meetings, and when I added up all the, the, the cost of all the bits and pieces and the CCD and the filter wheel and, and the decent mounting and all that, 
it came to about the same price. So the, the only thing about mine is that I can, it's more adaptable. I can use it for planetary observation as well. And these aren't good on planets. They've got a fixed field of view. So that's another example of an altazimuth mount, which is, I, I predict that these will become much more popular in the future. Equatorial mountings, uh, we've got a, a, a collection here. Uh, the very, the, they allow extended tracking of objects because they, uh, they are aligned on the sky. And we've got a couple of good examples here. As you can see, they don't point straight up and down. They have to point due north, and we're calling that north at the moment. Um, so this axis, the, the um, uh, RA axis, has to point at the pole star, and then you can use the other axis here to, other, to, to find other objects in the sky. Uh, and here's another example, again pointing north. And a very cheap example of um, an equatorial mount is known as the EQ-3. And a lot of cheap telescopes are on this kind of mounting, so I thought I'd bring one along. Um, it really is cheap, but to be honest, it's not all that brilliant. And that 130 goes on it. I didn't have time to put the telescope on the, 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 uh, on the head there. Now, one of the drawbacks of this, okay, it follows objects through the sky. Let me point it north like I'm supposed to. Robin, yeah? could you bring it into the gap there so the camera can see it? Oh, Thanks. Right. Easier said than done. Hold on. <laughs> That's fine, thanks. Okay, so it's, this axis is pointing north parallel with those there, and the telescope goes on there, and you have to align it at the pole star. Now, Martin Lewis says that beginners should be banned from buying these because they are so difficult to set up for somebody who doesn't know what's going on. And I have been at meetings where, observation meetings, where I've done a talk and, or there has been a talk showing people how to set up one of these, and then we've gone out and everybody's got one, and they're pointing in all directions. It's ridiculous. You would think after that people would know where the pole stop go. Um, so, uh, that they are, they can be difficult to set up if you don't know what you're doing. But to be honest, you, all you need to do is find the pole star, align that in that way, you don't need to be too clever about it, just point it at the pole star, and once you know the pole star, then you're set up really. And then the, this is the declination axis, moves like that. Now, um, complicated setup and use for beginners require alignment on the sky for every use, as I've said. Most require a counterweight, counterweight which adds to the weight and convenience, uh, and inconvenience, I should have uh, said. And may um, reduce stability. Okay, it's very heavy, but um, it, it, it does tend, to, it's, it's way off balance. You can see that the whole thing is, is quite long now. And so you can have a problem of the thing moving around uh, because the whole thing is, 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 is rather gawky, shall we say. It's, it's not, at all, uh, not at all the neat system. Whereas with an altazimuth mount, Everything is over, the centre of gravity is right over the centre of the, the tripod. This is, the centre of gravity is over the centre of the tripod, but you've got a bit sticking out. And when you've got a telescope like this in your dome, and you're moving from place to place, and you've got a, 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 about a sort of bowling ball weight of, of counterweights on the, on the end there, um, as you can see, if you walk into that in the middle of the night, uh, you don't enjoy it too much. Um, now, there are two types. Um, well, several types, I should say. There's the German equatorial mount, called the GEM, the German equatorial mount. And this is a German equatorial. That's the German equatorial. So is that. They all look slightly different, but they all basically are the same kind of device. And this is on a, um, the Skywatcher 130 on driven EQ2, £259. That is a, a very popular telescope, really, because it's, it's so cheap and... It will give you a good field view of the uh, sky. The non-driven version costs 199, but it's not worth having because if you're going to have a an equatorial mount, you might as well have it driven, because then it tracks the object in the sky once you've found it, 
and it doesn't matter if you're a bit off, it will still stay in the field of view quite a long time. So that is uh, the one go for. Skywatcher Explorer 150 on a, a more advanced one with a go to £679. Um, Pyoptron have got this curious looking device which again has got a counterweight, it's centre balance so that the, the, the field, the centre of gravity is more over the centre of the tripod but it's still, um, that's going to set you back 1179 for the mount only. Now we come on to, I'll just do with this one next, the Celestron fork mount. You don't get these anymore, it's the, the basic Schmidt Cassegrain, uh, um, well I'll use this as an example, this is the fork mount, but on this, on this occasion you can, in this case you can tilt it on the, well I won't do it the whole way up because the handset will fall off, but you can tilt it to turn it into, uh, into an equatorial. And that's what's done here by means of a wedge, uh, well, a wedge somewhere uh, for that one. I'm sure, I brought it in. It's around somewhere. Doesn't matter. Uh, didn't get a chance to set it up. Oh, here it is. Look, there's a nice heap of iron. Oops. That screws onto there, and then your telescope is overhanging the whole tripod, and your big telescope is, is, I can set this up if people really want to see it, but uh, it, it is quite a cumbersome job to, uh, to handle. And they have, you can still get the, these wedges for some Celestron telescopes, but uh, at one time all Schmidt categories were designed in that way, and then they realised that people, they, they are not a good design actually, although the, uh, even on the Altazimuth version, the problem is that once the telescope is pointing in the same direction as the forks of the uh, uh, of, of the mount, you, you you really can't get your eye in there. So it's not a good design. Whereas with the German equatorial mount, this is a, another Schmidt Cassegrain on a standard German equatorial mount, and you can see that the eyepiece is quite free of uh, of the mount, so it's much easier to use. All the, most telescopes these days are fitted with a dovetail. The most standard one is the Vixen type, and it means, yep, yeah, this has got one, and um, not that one. Yeah. Uh, this was a Losmondy dovetail, isn't it? Yeah, Losmondy. Large, yeah, so that's a larger size, um, but there's one. The Vixen size, the Vixen type dovetail means you can swap telescopes, so you can put, take this and stick it on that mount if you wanted, uh, or you could stick it on that. Um, the one at the back, which is a, a just a standard a little driven mount, and it means that there's a lot of uh, adaptability. Vixen type dovetail or the larger one is the Losmondy type. Now, so at that point, I will stop. I've went on longer than I planned and hand over. So, so who can we start with Tim? Okay, or should I go with these? Okay, the yeah. So we start with Altazimuth to start with. Yep. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, that's working. Um, this is my telescope. This is not my telescope, it's Wellness's. It's available for loan, so if any of you are interested in borrowing it, let us know. Um, yeah, this is a Dobsonian telescope, which is £1,200 or so in this size. If you buy that version without the motor, uh, just manual control. Invented by John Dobson in San Francisco in 1975 or thereabouts. He put ideas together. He didn't claim this as his invention. Uh, he said the wars have been won for centuries using cannons mounted on Dobsonian mounts. So he recognised that he was just using old technology for a new means. Uh, often put on Teflon bearings. Teflon, very low coefficient of friction so that they move very smoothly. This one is not quite the same because it's just motorised. And let me up the price from £1,200 to about £1,900. And it comes with electronics. Now, one thing that Robin has mentioned is power supplies. They all require a power supply. This one has got a power supply of eight batteries in the in the base. Um, I don't think no, I don't think this has got any batteries. But what I use, you, you can buy power packs, which are quite expensive. They're about this size, very heavy lead acid um, power supplies, which provide you with 12 volts. They provide you with lights. They provide you with USB outputs as well. 
but you have to maintain them, you have to use them all the time because batteries of any sort will run down and they will deplete if you don't use them. And if you put them away at the end of the winter, forget about them until the next winter, then uh, a couple of cycles like that and they, they, they've had it. This is something I bought some years ago, it's a lithium battery which is uh, much more compact, but again it went the same way of the other lead acid batteries. So what I bought before going to Wales was this lead acid battery which is just a well, it's, it's in place. I, you, you might be able to see it there. And I hope the camera is pointing. Yes, good, thanks. But there's a lead-acid battery down there, which was £29 for 21 amp hours, which is plenty. And if that lasts me a couple of years and then it dies, it's, it's not 70, 80 or £90 pounds that I've thrown away, or at least used. It's, it's less than £30, pounds, so that's, that's very good. And I can use that with this power supply, uh, with that telescope as well. Um, now, the, 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 the beauty of a dobsonian like this is that you get the maximum aperture for your money, uh, particularly if you get it non-computerized, but uh, that's quite a big telescope for £1,200, and the um, electronics uh, adds, as I say, makes it £1,900. It's a very popular model. Um, there was another one, uh, Rainer Hirsch, who is a member who many of you know. Um, he had one before I bought this, and I discussed it with him. Uh, I, I asked him, is, is that the size you would buy if you were buying again? Because this is a 12 inch, they come in 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 inches, but he said he would still buy the 12 inch despite it being <laughs> obviously large. It's as big as you can handle by yourself. Any bigger? No. The manual just does describe it as being extremely portable. Well, some of you saw me struggling <laughs> with it coming in here, I, I wouldn't quite call it extremely portable, but portable it is. Uh, I could put it in my car if I'm travelling locally, because I use it principally visually for outreach. Uh, that's, that's a principal use. But, um, yeah, it, it can go in my car. That will go on the back seat when it's comp because this comes down to here. And that will sit in the boot or somewhere else in the car. You might have seen me putting it together. Uh, I put it together, and this is a very handy way of screwing things tight very quickly, uh, a drill, but uh, I put it together because it had been a part, uh, having come back from Wales, to take it to Wales with a suitcase and everything else, I did, um, I, I did take the base apart, and then it's even more compact, but uh, I'll take it home tonight, fully made, I'll just put it back in the car as it is, and I'll leave it at that in my shed in the garden. Um, it's... Um, it's, it's very good optics, and the controls are very good. Uh, Robin alluded to how it is that you set it up. You put in your position, your latitude and longitude, which it remembers mercifully. You put in the time. It switches off. You've got to lose connection. It forgets the time. I, I think that's the same with that one, too. Uh, it's, it's, it's a nuisance. I'm sure that today, uh, this is about six or seven years old, I'm sure today they will remember the time, but it, it's, it's silly. They really ought to be able to remember the time, but they, they, they don't, and you have to put it in all the time. I always stick with UT. I don't bother with BST, because uh, with that one I did have a problem, it didn't seem to work, so I, I just simply default to UT all the time. Um, Yes, uh, this comes off. Now, to, to use it, uh, Robin mentioned how you align it. it it's, it's quite straightforward. It just takes a couple of minutes. Uh, once you put in the time and your position, latitude and longitude, and you've made sure that it's on, terrest sorry, <laughs> on astronomical tracking, because uh, terrestrial, and it will just stay still. Same with that one. Uh, but then I always use uh, two-star alignment. Um, it chooses the star for you to point at, so you have to know the sky a little bit. If you don't like that star, uh, Vega was behind a tree in Wales the other day, uh, I was able to scroll down to the next one until I found one which was uh, in the field of view, visible. And it's best to go for a star over there and another star over there at right angles, and then you get the best alignment. And it is pretty good. Okay, it's quite a wide field of view with this telescope, but it is good, it's accurate. If you, uh, there is a, I forgot what it's called, but it's a sort of refined um, alignment where when you start looking for a couple of objects it will locate a nearby bright star and center on that first and you can center on that star so it's a simple procedure that if you do two or three times then even very faint objects will be in the middle of the field of view uh, once you've gone through that procedure and it's well worth doing one other thing which is awfully important to do and it's more important than anything I think is aligning the spotted telescope uh, <laughs> 
how many of us find that you're just getting to the limit of the, you're, you're just getting there, getting uh, through the spotter in the cross wires, what you're looking at in the centre of field in here, and you're just at the limit of, 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 of travel of adjustment. Uh, uh, it's very frustrating, it happens all the time. Uh, in which case I'll loosen off the, the base there and I can make adjustments. But, but that is a very important procedure to go through. Um, so it, it is very accurate. Uh, as I say, I use it largely visually. It's F5, F4.9, which gives you bright images. Uh, Robin was saying F10 or 14, that gives you fainter images, smaller field of view. But it's, it's, a, a, it's a good field. It's quite a large field of view. At F5, objects are quite bright. So particularly if you're doing outreach, that certainly helps. And if you want to use it for photography, you have to move this into a slightly different position because the focal length, has, the, the focal plane has to be here for the uh, camera instead of closer in for the eyepiece. But that can be accounted for by, by adjusting these. There are two settings, two positions for this. Um, it, it, it was producing slightly coma images when I was at Wales. I didn't have time to adjust the uh, collimation. Uh, Rainer actually had a, a tool which he was able to use on this, and in two or three minutes he was able to align the optics because this had just got sl slightly skew width. Um, yeah, uh, Rainer had one of this at the uh, at Wales uh, the other weekend. But um, a couple of years ago, I think there were four or five of these same instruments, some of them computerized, some of them not. So that sort of indicates that uh, they, they must be good instruments and they are good value for money. Two things really when it comes to what you're going to spend on the telescope is what you can afford, but also what it's worth. If you only use it occasionally, what's the point of spending all that money? Um, so th those are the two considerations. But this one certainly in terms of uh, value for money for what, what you get, I, I think it's, it's, it's extremely good. Um, indeed. I think all the other things I would have thought of saying were covered by Robin already. Any, any, any questions? Yeah, you said it, it, you, can, you can go to. Yes. Does it track it? Yes. It does. Yes, it does. It does. And as Robin says, if you're photographing, then the object will rotate in the field of view. Does any software account for the rotation yet? Not software, no. On the smart telescopes, there is right. actually a field rotator right. in, in one of them. Right. <clears throat> Otherwise, you're limited to right. very short exposure. But maybe that's something that will come, that the stacking <clears throat> software that, uh, that so many maybe people deep, use. Deep Sky Sacket will add all your 15-second exposures. Right, even if they rotate? Yes. Okay, yes. all right. So <laughs> you can overcome the problem of a rotation that you get from Altasima uh, mount. Um, yes? Sorry, sorry to say this. Can I challenge your assertion? that uh, visually yes. a short focal length will give you a brighter image. It will photographically, but an, a, a telescope of a given size, yeah. F5, will surely give you the same image as, a, as the same size F15 with a, an eyepiece of three times the focal length. I, I wouldn't have thought so because yes, the that's long... That's Mm? We think yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, you're, you're saying? Yes, we think it, Trevor's right. OK, well, we'll discuss this in the bar later. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you outside. <laughs> Any other points? Does the open side make a difference? Uh, not really. I mean, it, 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 it'll allow question? for currents of air. What was the question again? Uh, do, do, does the fact that it's open oh, right. affect? Not, not particularly. It, sh it should improve it because the air can get into the tube. Yes, so it, it'll stabilise because in, in say a professional observatory in a professional observatory they will open the dome a couple of hours before dark so that it all stabilises so this will automatically stabilise and as Robin said you don't have a problem with dewing because the mirror is surrounded the mirrors are surrounded and so, so they don't cool down. Sort of Sorry? I'm, I was thinking more of light going... Ah, stray light. You're thinking of stray light? Yeah, yeah. Um, not particularly. I mean, it's obviously black for, for reasons, uh, clear reasons. It depends it where you're observing, doesn't it? If, you, if you've got street lights around all shining in and someone switches on their bathroom or kitchen light, then <laughs> you've got a problem. Yeah, yeah. But um, otherwise, you know, the other parts of the sky don't really trouble you. I used to have a Dobsonian many years ago, and Martin Lewis. It fitted encoders, 
to the coders, so you could actually, you had to move it yourself rather uh, than tracking, like yeah. find the objects. Yeah. Yeah, this, 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 once you've set it up, one, one, oh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Eddie, because one big plus of this is that once you've set it up, once you've aligned it, and you've got to leave the motor to do the alignment, particularly the second star, but, um, but once you've aligned it, if you go through the catalogue to see an object, and the object is way over there, then yes, it can track quite quickly, it's, it's working now, it's at maximum speed, I'll move it, so it moves, it can move quite quickly, But what you can do is if the object is over there, you can save some time uh, and you can just simply push it around. The encoder knows where it's looking at now and it'll just do the, the, the final fine tuning once, once you've got it closed. So it saves time, it saves battery. Uh, so that is another benefit of this. Perhaps we should move on to yeah. Tim. Okay, now. Tim. Describe his. This one, I think we've already covered it. Uh, I think we've already covered that. As I say, it is a wireless instrument, so if anybody wants to, to borrow it, um, let us know. Um, shall I move this out a bit so everyone can see it? Right, so this is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of size to that one. Um, this is a uh, Maxutov um, Cassegrain telescope, um, and as Robin said before, this has got the this is a 127, so about five inch um, aperture. This has got the fixed um, secondary mirror at the front, and it's all totally sealed tube. Um, and this has got um, a it's, it's not a fully go-to mount, it's a sort of half, it tracks, it will basically track anything, but it all needs to be set up to, to the home position, as they say, facing north, and then completely, um, oops, completely horizontal before you start. And then basically you have to find all the objects yourself, using the viewfinder um, and then once you've found the objects you can set it to actually track um, but as Stuart and Robin said it's basically because it's an altazimuth mount although it's tracking you'll still get that issue with um, field rotation um, because it's basically going up in steps it's not kind of following the sky smoothly on one axis like the equatorial. Um, the plus points of this though are, are it's um, relatively cheap. I think the tube, just to buy the tube um, for this is about £300. Um, with the mount and obviously you can get the upgraded one which is um, the go-to the go -to handset, um, that's about £500 for the whole thing. Um, so this has got a right angle star diagonal so you can look in you look in at a comfortable angle and then you can see you don't have to sort of go like this like a refractor. Um, as I said you have to line this up line this up perfectly with the um, with the main telescope so that you always can find objects easily. Um, what else can I say? This has got, um, the focusing is by mirror shift. It shifts the mirror in and out. And as stated before, you, get, you do get image shift. If you've got something lined up here and you try and focus it, it hops around all over the place. Um, you can put, you can put a Crayford um, a focuser on the actual eyepiece end. So what I do sometimes is have the focuser on here, just do the, the, the um, coarse adjustment using the mirror. And then to get the fine adjustment, actually focus so it moves the eyepiece in and out. Um, what else? The plus points of this are obviously the cost. It's really portable. Um, 
it basically weighs a few kilograms. Um, so you can set it up really quickly within minutes and just get observing straight away. Um, the negative sides, the cons are, um, obviously it's not as powerful as some of these other telescopes. You can only, you can w look at the moon and planets up to, say, 150 magnif times magnification. Um, so it's much smaller, you won't, you won't get the same light to grasp anything like any of these bigger instruments. Uh, but it's portable, easy to use, and um, compared to sort of an 8-inch telescope, it's a lot lighter and easier to move around. Where have you, where have you observed with it? Um, all over the place, from um, back garden to um, um, Ricelip Lido, places that we go to where we can just put the telescope in the car and um, just set it up straight away. What about planets? What sort of a view do you get of Jupiter and Saturn and so on? You get a good view and you can see the, you can see the main belts. Um, great red spot, you might need to image it to actually see it. I've never seen it visually in this, in this one. Um, obviously the rings of Saturn, craters of the Moon, that sort of thing. It's a great beginner's telescope, this one. Yeah. Have you tried to mount a camera to, take, uh, to make astrophotography? You can. I've got, I don't use the normal camera. I use a, um, what's basically a webcam. It's a ZWO um, imaging camera where you can just, you basically just, it's got um, a one and a quarter inch um, eyepiece mount. It just goes straight into the eyepiece. And then yeah. obviously there's a bit more focusing to get, it's, it's not uh, par focal, so you have to adjust it um, separately to what you'd see with your eye sort of thing. Because I've, I've tried to use it with one of the standard, the uh, EOS Canon cameras, and right. I find it because it's a bit too heavy, it kind of uh, straggles. <coughs> oh right, I think that would, the camera would probably be almost as heavy as the telescope in yeah. this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really conversed with um, using cameras on telescopes, to be honest. I, I use a little webcam thing, which is only about a few, a few, few grams, really, I suppose. I think that that's where I'm going to reverse. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it. yeah, there's probably other people who've you've tried putting cameras on these kind of telescopes. But, um, yeah. You could try a light PSLR. Yes. It's very light, but compared to that, you know, rather heavy. Through. Just put the sensor on it. <laughs> Just put the sensor out the camera. Oh, get the get the CCD out. It's it. a secondary mirror, and you don't need any of that garbage. That's <laughs> worth trying. That's worth trying. <laughs> if it's got a dovetail mount, you should be able to slide the tube forward. Yeah, you can balance and it. And it will balance the weight of the camera. Yeah. You can only do it if you've got a dovetail type mount. I think the mount's probably going to be the limiting factor here because yeah, this yeah, is you quite. Hit the, hit the base, that's the problem. Yeah, I've got, um, as Robin said, with the dovetail, um, I've got a, an EQ5 mount as well, which is like one of the, not as sturdy as that, but sort of halfway between this and that. And you can just easily take this off, slide it onto the equatorial mount. And then you've got a much more powerful setup, really. This is an EQ5, isn't it? This is that uh, one at back is an EQ5, the black one. Oh yeah. That's... How do you think you, it, it would compare visually to a uh, hundred mil refractor? Um, people have there's different controversy about that, isn't there? Because I think you've because of the central obstruction. This is about 33%. Yeah, I have, um, I have done that direct comparison. I've got a 5-inch SPT, and I've compared it with this long blue one. Right. The 100mm refractor, and the 100mm refractor is better. Yeah, because you get more contrast. You, yeah. you lose contrast with this. Um, yeah. Because it, even though, obviously, when it's focusing on infinity, you don't see it, but it's actually detracting from the main sort of field in a way with a con there's a shadow there that you can't see yeah, really having, having said that the maxi top design the advantage of it is that the sec the secondary mirror is smaller yeah. than it is in a uh, schmidt cassegrain of the same size and same yeah. focal ratio 
uh, well, the focal ratio of maxi shots is higher, it's about 15, yeah. whereas SCTs are about F10. And that, so SCTs have a larger secondary mirror and that reduces the contrast more. So the maxi shots have a, an edge uh, right. with respect to SCTs in that respect, but they're still not as good as refractors yeah. in terms of contrast. I guess the longer the focal, the actual focal length, then basically by that time the light path, well, you, you need a smaller, yeah. you don't need as big a bigger surface to reflect that light cone because the light cone is much tinier by the time it gets, you know, like double the distance or something. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. <clears throat> David, do you want to start off the equatorial discussion with your... I'll talk a bit about refractors and uh, equatorial mounts as well. Those of you who know me know I've got a lot of telescopes, uh, but this is one I like. Uh, this is the 100 millimeter F9 ED design. It's a very popular design. It's been around for a long time, uh, and it's excellent for lunar and planetary work. Uh, so as Robin said, the ED refers to the type of glass in the front lens, in the objective lens, and it's a type of glass which gives a low level of chromatic aberration. Because it's quite a long telescope, it will give you high magnifications easily. We haven't talked much about magnification, so magnification is given by the ratio of the focal length of the objective to the focal length of the eyepiece. So if you've got a long focal length objective, in other words, a long, narrow telescope, then you can easily get high magnifications out of it, which you need for looking at the planets with eyepieces which are not excessively small, eyepieces which are not excessively short focal length. And the problem is you can get, yes, you can get high magnifications out of short focal length telescopes with very short focal length eyepieces, but they're difficult to look into. You've got this tiny lens and it, you have to get your eye right up to it and it's very difficult if you're wearing spectacles. Whereas if you've got a longer focal length telescope, you can use a longer focal length eyepiece to get a good magnification. The eyepiece here is, um, that I've got in here is 11 millimeters and that will give a magnification of about 80 or 90 times on this telescope. And you don't have to put your eye very close up to it to get a good view. So, one advantage of having a long telescope, and I found this very striking at the public observing sessions, is that the focus doesn't need to be very precise. If you imagine with a, a low focal ratio, as in this telescope, which is about f6 or something, you've got a, a very sharply converging cone of light at the eyepiece. If you move in or out, only a tiny fraction of a millimetre, you're away from that focal point significantly, and it's not in focus. But if you've got a long pencil of light, as you have in a long telescope, you can move like half a millimetre or so the focus, and it doesn't make much difference. And that means that a whole selection of people, if I've got a queue of people, if I just set the telescope up for infinite focus, just set it up for me using my spectacles, get it nicely focused, tell them, don't touch the focus, just look through it. I find most people can get a precise focused image because it's not that fussy, because there's, there's considerable give and take in where the focal position is. So people with different eyes and slightly wonky eyes or slightly astigmatic eyes, they're still getting a good image. And when I've taken this to Rice and Lilo sessions or the Baker Street Astronomy sessions in Regent's Park, I, I've shown people Jupiter and people who've never looked through a telescope before, and they've been able to see the Great Red Spot in the past couple of years, or before lockdown, when the Great Red Spot was nice, was rather small, but uh, strongly, strongly red. And Tim mentioned that with this telescope, he does, he's never been able to see the Great Red Spot, and yet that's a larger aperture than this one. So, where in theory, aperture should correlate with the amount of detail you can see. The bigger the aperture should give you more detail, but in practice it's more complicated than that. And in practice, long focal ratio telescopes do very well in giving good high resolution views of the moon and the planets at high magnification 
and also double stars. You get lovely images of double stars through this telescope. You can look at, say, the double-double Epsilon Lyrae, where it has with the four components, two over there, two over there, and each of those pairs is separated by two arc seconds. And you can put a high magnification on, and you need a magnification of about 200, 300 to see those clearly. And you can see them very clearly split uh, with, with um, that, that um, two arc second separation is very, very clearly defined. Whereas I find with a catageoptic telescope of this kind of size, it, it's smudgy. You can imagine it, you can see it, but it, it's not clear. So uh, long refractors give uh, high contrast images and very sharp images. The disadvantage of this telescope, obviously, is it's quite a hefty thing. And because it's long, it's sensitive to being blown about. It's sensitive to wind, it's sensitive to vibration. It needs to be on quite a sturdy mount. This is called, this, this was called, probably doesn't exist anymore, this was called the Celestron CG5 mount. It's the same as the uh, Cinta EQ5 mount. This over here is the EQ6 mount. There doesn't seem to be an EQ4 mount. I've never quite worked out why the EQ4 doesn't exist. Uh, and this, this, this one, that's the EQ2, and the EQ3 is, is one that Robin showed in, yeah, in, in one of his pic, in, my, is, is in one of those pictures up there. But I would say, if you're interested in doing long exposure imaging, you need to consider the subject of mountings long and hard. And for long exposure imaging, we usually recommend a German equatorial mount because they give accurate tracking. Although these systems can track, these uh, motorized and computerized altazimuth systems can track, they do it by a series of little step motions, it's never all that accurate. Whereas having an equatorial mount where the telescope only has to move in one axis to follow the motion of the stars around the sky, you're only dependent on the accuracy of this drive, of this, it, how it works, it's got a big wheel which is toothed, it's called a worm and wheel drive, and it's got a, a worm which is a, a thread which engages with the teeth, toothed wheel, and the motor rotates that worm, and the, that moves very slowly, the absidereal rate, that moves the big toothed gear wheel, which is in here, or it's it's in here, it's, it's enclosed within plastic housing. And your tracking accuracy depends on the accuracy with which those gears have been made. And you can probably get some reasonable results with the EQ5 level mount, maybe go to 30 seconds exposure on a telescope of moderate focal length, about a metre, half a metre to a metre focal length, or maybe you can get a minute's exposure out of it, but you won't get really long exposures without a, a much heftier mount, without something like this, without something like the EQ6 mount, or even better. And with that, you would be able to get two-minute exposures. If you did really accurate polar alignment, you could probably get five or ten-minute exposures. I wouldn't bother going longer than that, because you always get satellite trails through the pictures anyway. But this, this telescope I use mainly for visual observation, and it is the biggest telescope I can possibly get on the bus. It really gets in every... It, it travels around in this bag, but, uh, which is an adaptive shopping trolley, and I've had several of these, and several of them have broken. Uh, and it gets in everybody's way on the bus, and when I take it down to Regent's Park, I take it through the tube as well, down to Camden Town Underground, which is quite fun. But it's, um, it, it, it's, not, it's, not all that, it's not all that practical solution for that. So I, if I think if I was starting again now, I would very much consider this kind of design. Uh, because they're, they're, they're so much more possible. Uh, these single arm mounts, they can't be used without power. So if the power fails, you're stuck. Whereas this kind of equatorial mount, you can just loosen off the clutches. And provided it's balanced, you can just move it around the sky manually. The balance is quite important in setting it up to get that right so that it's balanced around, 
around the two axes so the telescope is slid up and down in its rings to balance it about the declination axis and that has to be done with everything on it with the finder fitted and the and the IP fitted and so on and then you move this counterweight up and down to balance it about the, the polar axis but in general it's not that finicky you don't have to be that precise about it because uh, the once the motors are engaged and once the clutches are on it, it, it will drive even if it's slightly out of balance the, the setup procedure for this kind of mount the, for equatorial mounts at the cheaper end of the market is quite complicated and uh, people tend to buy them thinking that oh they'll solve all my problems in finding objects in the sky but in reality for this kind of go-to system you need quite a good knowledge of the sky to make it work at all because when you first plug it in as Robin says it asks you asks you for your location which you have to put in you have to put in the date and the time and it doesn't remember any of those things and then it asks you to go through an alignment procedure where you have to choose three stars in the sky three bright stars and in succession you point the telescope to each of those stars and then you tell the mountain that it's pointed at each of those stars and it has to net so you have to know the names of the bright stars you can't mustn't confuse Vega with Altair or whatever otherwise the whole procedure will go wrong although having said that I have found there's a quicker way of doing it that you can just choose this is this handset is called the Celestron next star system and it's the same as one of these other telescopes that's that's one of the others is now oh, this is this yes this dog phone has exactly the same handset they're used with a wide variety of telescopes and you can tell it to not do the alignment at all you can tell it last alignment use the last alignment and so then if you have put in the date and time approximately right and also you've got the color alignment approximately right it will just assume everything is in the right places as it was last time and so you don't need to spend half an hour aligning it and that's very useful for the public observing when you don't want to waste a lot of time aligning it when you've got lots of little children coming around and uh, uh, ask, asking to look through the telescope uh, but to do the full alignment takes quite a long time. I would say the whole thing takes about 20 minutes to set up and uh, the alignment, if you went through the full alignment procedure, it would probably take another 10 minutes or so. So it takes quite a lot of setting up this kind of equatorial uh, go-to system and you have to have quite a good knowledge of the sky to make it work well. And even when it is working well, at this kind of price point, this kind of size of mount it's not all that precise you'd be doing well to get an object like Messier 42 or whatever object you ask it to go to you'd be doing well to get it in a in a low power eyepiece sometimes you only get it in the finder field you probably won't get it in the high power eyepiece without doing a lot of searching around yourself so that the go-to's are not really all that accurate and you mustn't imagine that at this level of expenditure like this a mountain like this probably cost about 300 pounds two or three hundred pounds uh, you you're not going to get great accuracy and you really need this kind of level or better uh, an observatory class mountain if you want to be able to just go straight into the observatory straight to the telescope without any setting up and tell it go to this object and it will go precisely to that object and it will be reliably in the field that really only works at a much more expensive price point like your could we, could we hear from the owner of this now please uh, uh, so this is uh, Les yeah, okay. right okay um, this is my uh, six inch roughly s6 uh, refractor um, it's a very short focal length um, as reflect reflectors go traditionally um, normally you didn't get refractors before uh, shorter than about f10 um, but with these modern glasses you can get shorter ones um, it's not a planetary telescope because of its short uh, focal length the chromatic aberration is such that you wouldn't really want to use this for planetary imaging 
but it does have a, a good wide field of view. Um, so I use it as my main imaging system. Um, I use normally um, a filter to reduce the blue fringing around objects. Um, but the main reason I bought it was to demonstrate the uh, very clever electronics that you can get these days. Um, this has a, a system based on a Raspberry Pi um, computer system. It's made by the WO that made the camera and it's, it's fitted out with the main camera so to do the imaging and a small guide camera in the spotting scope, in the guide scope, um, which will allow it to physically track the object rather than just relying on the accuracy of the worm gear. It will, the guide camera will actually look at the star images um, and will physically make adjustments uh, to make sure that the uh, mount will track for as long as you as you want it to, really. Um, as David said, if you go more than about two minutes, you're just going to start getting satellite trail and aeroplanes and all sorts of things. So I don't normally go more than about two minutes. Um, but this particular system takes the place of the handset. You notice that the handset that used to come with its mount is no longer plugged in. And it's plugged into this device. And the... Um, turned off. Um, ah, there we go. Um, the whole system is controlled from a laptop, from a, um, a tablet. Um, um, it does everything. It does the polar alignment. Um, it tells you whether your polar alignment is accurate and allows you to make adjustments. Once you've done that, um, it will then control the go-to quite accurately. And it also does plate solving, which is mentioned earlier. Um, and that will allow it to know exactly what it's pointing at. And if you tell it what you want to look at using your laptop, um, it will actually move to it. So I've got um, it being used in conjunction with the Sky Safari, um, the uh, Planetarium program. And at the moment, the telescope is in its um, home position. But if I wanted to look at, for example, M81, I would choose M81 <coughs> from Sky Safari, and then I would press Go To, and it will go to uh, and uh, find it by itself. You just have to keep an eye on it just to make sure that your um, cables aren't getting tangled up. Because there is a lot of uh, cables with a lot of system like this. And you occasionally get a horrible noise when, if you're not watching it where cables have got snagged. Um, once you've uh, got the object set up in, in your field of view, which um, you can confirm with the plate solving, um, you can then start your um, observing run. You tell it to start tracking. Um, the uh, computer will find and choose a star to track on and will start tracking automatically and that's all, all you have to do. You can then program an imaging run, however many uh, images you want to take. Say you want to take 30 images um, of 30 seconds, for example, um, and you just press the button um, and it gets on with it. You can then, if you want to, you can then go in and have a cup of coffee and just leave it to get on with it. Um, Uh, there are a few other things that um, it does. It has um, cooling as well. Um, the it's a cooled camera, which means it's more efficient uh, and has less noise. So the, the 
the Wi-Fi gadget also provides the power for the cooling. Um, it can also provide um, power for the dew heaters, um, although I tend to use a separate battery for that because I don't want to drain the battery out in the uh, midst of observing by using a lot of power um, to drive the dew heaters. Um, because refractors, even though they've got reasonably long dew shields, um, they can dew up in, um, uh, in high humidity and in cold temperatures. Um, the whole system is relatively um, power intensive, so it does require quite substantial lead acid batteries to um, uh, drive it all, which means it's not the whole system isn't terribly portable. Um, this has been down to Wales last weekend, um, but it's about as much as my car can cope with. <laughs> um, um, so I think that's probably. Uh, <coughs> Probably about it. Um, that's another object. Let's see if, if we've finished um, taking a picture of M81. We can then choose another object. Let's say we wanted to go for the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51. Select it. Center it on the map. And go to. And off it will go to your next um, observing location. Nice and quiet, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, another thing about this is um, that it takes all of the information from the like, location and time um, from your tablet or iPhone. So you don't have to um, put that information in every time you use it, which saves time. Although you do have to spend a reasonable amount of time setting up the pole alignment, um, which can be a bit fiddly, just um, making small adjustments to the, to the screws um, and then going back, taking another test image. Um, it has its own separate routine for doing it, so it's not too complicated. Um, but it can probably take 10 minutes to get a, a good polar alignment. But once you've got, once you've done that, um, generally speaking, um, it finds the, um, finds every object. Um, um, without, um, without too much trouble really. Um, it seems to do it better than when I used to have to program the handset myself. So, uh, any questions? Yeah. Well, why did you say that you wouldn't use it for planetary? Um, it's because of the relatively short focal length of the telescope. Um, traditionally, refracting telescopes were maybe f10 to f15 um, to get good quality images as previously mentioned, without a lot of chromatic, ab chromatic aberration, without blue fringing around the objects. Um, with this, because it's such a short focal length, it's 900 millimetres um, in relation to its 150 millimetre diameter lens, um, even with modern glass, that still doesn't give you the best quality image. So it's much happier looking at wide fields of view um, than it is concentrating right down on a small object like a planet. Um, so you should uh, one only have reflectors then for planetary uh, No, not necessarily. Um, a, a long focal length refractor will give very good... Um, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's the combination of focal length and size that you put... Because mm. at a given focal length, the bigger the aperture is, of a achromatic refractor, the bigger the uh, chromatic aberration gets. Yeah. So I think it increases as the four, third power or something quite a lot. So a refractor of that size and that shape that has a much worse chromatic aberration than a refractor of this size and that shape, even though the shape is roughly the same. Yeah. Yeah. The other way of getting better quality um, from a refractor um, is to have 
um, uh, what's called an apochromatic um, system, which has got three lenses at the front rather than two. That gives much better colour correction, uh, which will give better images, but the price of those is, is very expensive. A six inch uh, apo um, would be, I think, the equivalent one for this. Um, I think it's about four and a half thousand pounds for the tube. Um, whereas this one, um, the hope, when I bought it, it was less than a thousand pounds. Um, I'm not sure what it is now, but... Um, when did you buy it? Oh, five or six years ago. Um, but uh, I didn't really buy it as a planetary telescope. I, I, I principally bought it as a wide field um, telescope for imaging. Did it, did it have all the electronics you've got? No. Um, um, I, I, the tube is, um, is one way. Uh, the mount is a, um, a Skywatcher um, EQ6 mount, which I bought separately. Um, um, and the electronics is um, um, provided by ZWO that um, make the cameras. There's one disadvantage of this particular one um, in that it only works with their own cameras. You can't mix and match different makes of camera. Um, there are similar things to this which are available um, which um, allow you to do to use different cameras but then you're into the realms of um, having to upload all, lots of different types of software and it all gets all rather complicated. So I chose this particular system because in theory, it all works together out of the box, um, which pretty much it has. Uh, I've been quite pleased with it. Um, I think it's a fantastic uh, system, but I'm not quite sure how much I would let myself in for if I wanted to buy the whole system. Yeah, in terms of total outlay. Yes. Yes, um, it does start to add up. Um, I think the this mount. I'm I'm not sure again now what it's how much it costs, but I think it was about fifteen hundred pounds when I bought it. Um, the probably two thousand. Probably possibly two thousand now. There is actually a slightly more updated version than this one now. Um, the electronics is three or four hundred pounds. Um, the camera was over a thousand pounds. Um, so it does look, it does start to add up to quite a lot of money, um, and sometimes when you get um, cloudy skies week after week after week, you do wonder whether it is a good investment. <laughs> I think we'd better move on now yes. because we've got. Thank you very much, okay. Les. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you to much. everybody else who helped out with the uh, the telescopes. Right. Well, our observations for uh, this month, we've had uh, quite a bit of clear sky. Uh, and uh, this uh, this is not this is a kind of observation. Uh, this is an observation of the people who went to the Wallace Observing Weekend in uh, Llanakinda Farm near uh, somewhere somewhere in the depths of Wales. Where is it near? It's near Llandovery. Yes. Uh, so we we uh, we completely booked the place out, and uh, we had one clear night on Friday night when it was clear all night and uh, quite a lot of observations were made and we saw a very spectacular thing which I had never seen before which was a Russian rocket which dumped its fuel into the top of the atmosphere and we saw this really bright thing vertically overhead and Martin Lewis called out saying there's a thing overhead and it was a really bright thing and it, and it kind of expanded and it was like an expanding cloud, like a bright, very bright star and an expanding cloud around it. It looked like some bizarre comet. It looked like, a bit like Comet Holmes looked through a telescope some years ago. But this was with the naked eye and much, much brighter. And as it went across the sky, it kept expanding out into a bigger and bigger cloud. I tried to take a picture of it, but failed. Uh, but also on the uh, rocket front or satellite front, uh, 
The Kuang Lan stayed in Edgware, and he managed to image the space station. The International Space Station had a couple of good passes, uh, several good passes. On the 5th of May, he imaged two of those passes at different times of night. That was 156 BST, imaged with his Canon 7D camera and uh, a 14 millimeter f2.8 lens, series of 10 second exposures. And uh, later that same night, at uh, 3.56, he caught it coming round again. International Space Station. I've uh, been taking some images of the moon, and this is one I took with my Newtonian reflector last year, and I only just got round to processing it. I thought, why, why is there so much stuff on this computer? There must be old videos on it. So I thought I'd better process up some of the old videos to make space for new ones. But this is interesting in connection with what we were talking about just now. This is an image taken with Newtonian reflector, and this is an image taken with the schmidt cassegrain telescope. Uh, that's a 14-inch schmidt cassegrain telescope, and that's taken with a 10-inch Newtonian reflector. schmidt cassegrain telescope has much longer focal length. It's a bigger telescope anyway, so you get a much... Uh, more detailed image, so you're much more zoomed in to the craters there than you are there. But also, you can see the coma in this image. You can see that only part of the image is sharp. This part is sharp, but it's much more blurry up here. It's not just that there are no shadows causing the detail to be less. It's actually more blurry up there. And that's what Robin was talking about with short focal Newtonian reflectors, about f4, f5. They have this blurriness towards the edge of the field. And if you've got a large camera, that's detectable in the camera, large format camera. There's another lens you can get, which is called a coma corrector, which corrects for that, but then that's just an extra thing to buy and an extra complication. So anyway, uh, it is possible to take images through uh, Newtonian, uh, short focus Newtonian reflectors like this. And uh, here's one of the moon, and that's... Uh, that's uh, uh, some famous craters there. That is uh, Shikard, that one. And that is the, the Plateau Wargentin. And uh, this is Bailey, right on the Terminator. That was quite a favourable libration for that Terminator. So the, that was taken last year, but this year I've been taking images with the Schmidt Cassegrain, 14 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. And this was last night. We had really good seeing last night. And these are some of the best lunar images I've ever got. It's really sharp, really high level of detail there. And this is, I put it um, long ways round, so the Terminator is going left to right in order to get like a more, uh, a more convenient shape for the projector or for a zoom presentation. So uh, this is... Uh, so, so many craters here, I really ha I had to look, look them all up. This is called, that's Blankinus, that's called Werner, that's called, that's, um, and that's the, the this next row is uh, Regiomontanus, Walter, no, that's Regiomontanus, that's Walter. Uh, and uh, these, uh, the, these are all around, 70, 80 kilometer diameter craters, but uh, the small features you can see are much, much smaller than a kilometer. Here's another one from last night. But incidentally, these were taken at prime focus, in other words, at the natural focal length of the 14 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, so it's about three meters focal length, and they're taken with an infrared filter uh, with a monochrome camera. This is a famous set of rills, or little valleys, or faults on the moon. Uh, this is Hyginus, and this is Treesnecker, and this is the Hyginus rill, and this is the system of rills around Treesnecker. And they, these are, 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 are stacked images. These are images taken with a video camera. This was uh, called the Chameleon 3 camera, and they are stacks of 30 second exposures uh, and the, the, the run lasts for 30 seconds and it takes uh, about a thousand or two thousand images in that time and those are stacked together. 
And here's a famous group of craters, that's Ptolemaeus, Alphonsus and Alzaco, and they were exactly on the Terminator at about midnight last night. So, uh, very fresh off the press, those are very detailed images. Ooh. Martin Lewis managed to catch elusive little Mercury. Martin can't come today, but that was 16th of April, when Mercury was well placed in the uh, late afternoon sky. Oh, 12, he took that just in the afternoon, 12.46 UT, with his smaller Dobsonian, with his 222 millimeter Dobsonian, and uh, an ASI 290 camera, and a, an infrared filter again. And this is the image, and that is, that is the space probe image, and that he's blurred the space probe image to show the correspondence between and you can see some of the same bright ray craters. Robin sent me this. This is the Blinking Planetary Nebula. NGC 6826 in Cygnus. The reason for its name is said to be that it is not bright enough to be seen visually. You see the central star visually, but if you use averted vision, in other words, you concentrate your attention on, you, you look at the corner of the field, but concentrate your attention on the object, then the nebulosity is said to blink into view. Uh, but it's said that this doesn't occur if you're light, using a light pollution filter. So this uh, is taken with the 80 millimeter refractor, so it's a similar size telescope to that one. Uh, this is it's the ED version of the 80 millimeter refractor, so it's it's the smaller cousin of this one, in fact. Mm -hmm. And taken with uh, uh, an Attic 314L camera, and uh, it's 10 60 second exposures each of luminance red, green, and blue, total of 40 minutes exposure, so a lot of exposure there. And Robin has also sent me. Uh, picture of NGC 5466 in Boötes. Boötes is a constellation which is prominent in the spring sky, doesn't contain many interesting deep sky objects, uh, and, but here's one of the few deep sky objects that it does contain. Uh, quite a faint little globular cluster, uh, quite hard to pick out visually, you need dark skies and a large telescope to see that, so I think it's about uh, tenth magnitude taken on 5th of May. And this again is taken with the 80mm ED refractor, uh, which are very good, very good telescopes for taking deep sky images, not very expensive telescopes either. And that was 10 60 second exposures of, of luminance and two 60 second exposures each of red, green and blue. So he's got much more exposure for the luminance, in other words, the black and white background than he's taken for the colour. You don't need to take so many colour exposures. Here's one that I, I pinched off um, <coughs> Duncan Radbourne's Facebook page. He didn't actually send me this, but this is what he was working on at Hlanakinda. He, he uh, got set up tremendously early on the Friday evening, and he got all his system working with his Celestron 11, tracking perfectly, and he got some lovely images. And he was imaging all night on that Friday night at Hlanakinda, making good use of the very dark skies that we have there, and that's Messier 101, a very famous spiral galaxy, and uh, that was taken with the Celestron 11, with the focal reducer, and uh, a, a, a colour camera, an ASI ZWO294 colour camera, and it's 27 60 second images, so it's uh, 27 minutes of exposure, and you wouldn't get such a good result as that from a light polluted location. That's actually quite a small amount of exposure for a low surface brightness galaxy like that. Uh, you would have to image for many hours, I think, to get as good an image from London if you could, and you probably couldn't at all. And he took images of many other galaxies that night, but this is the only one I've seen so far that he has actually issued. Here's some more galaxies. These were taken by me from London uh, on uh, April the 27th. And the object of interest here is actually a supernova. Uh, 
and I've labelled this image in the next one to show you. The brightest galaxy there is Messier 60, but the supernova is not in that. Next to Messier 60, there is NGC 4647. And the scene in NGC 4647, Messier 60, is supernova 2022 HRS. And that appeared recently and has been attracting quite a lot of attention from amateur astronomers. As you see, that supernova is as bright as it, of the whole of its parent galaxies, as bright as the whole of NGC 4647. And then there's quite a lot of other galaxies in that image. Incidentally, there's Messier 59 and other galaxies. These are all in the Virgo cluster. So it's fortunate that this happened in a part of the sky which is very well displayed currently. And this was taken with a black and white CCD camera, called CCD camera, 66 millimeter telescope, very small telescope, but on a very big mounting. So I get accurate tracking with, on that mounting without having to use any auto guiding. And that was 12 two minute exposures. So not all that much exposure and a very light, lightly polluted location. So that's why the background is so noisy, but nevertheless, that's potentially a scientifically useful image. You could, in principle, determine the brightness of the supernova from that image. I haven't done so, but you could follow it, and uh, you could uh, get the find out what the decay of the brightness is from that kind of image, even though it's taken from a light polluted location. So, what's coming up? Uh, well, it's we're approaching the next full moon. And there'll be an eclipse, and the, the eclipse is really the main news this month, and there's the dates of the other moon phases. The next new moon is May the 30th. So the eclipse on 16th of May will be low down in the southwest, uh, and the penumbral eclipse, uh, which is always very difficult to detect visually, uh, starts uh, half past one in the morning. The umbra contacts at... 0228, but at that stage the moon is only 10 degrees high. And totality starts at, at half past three, but the moon sets not long after. The moon sets at 410 around mid eclipse. So, what you need to get is a, a vantage point, maybe an upstairs window, where you can look down low in the southwest and get your telescope or your camera set up there on uh, early morning of 16th of May, in other words, it's the night of the 15th to the 16th of May. And uh, after the umbra contacts at 0228, you should see that dark bite starting to be taken out of the moon. And it's always interesting to follow lunar eclipses to see how dark they are. Sometimes they're very dark gray, sometimes they're a bright orange color, depending on the way the light is refracted through the Earth's atmosphere. And of course, that will, this one will be very much reddened by the moon being so low down as well. So it should be colourful if you have a good clear sky down to that altitude, which you'd be quite lucky to have, of course. Uh, so that's how the moon is passing through the Earth's shadow for this eclipse. It's passing not quite centrally, uh, but it's passing through one side of the shadow. So one side, so the north side of the moon will be the side that gets darkest, the side that is most in the shadow. As for the planets, they're all concentrated in the morning sky. Uh, this is, is a chart 30 minutes before sunrise. And uh, Saturn is the first, first coming along here. 17 degrees high, uh, half an hour before dawn. And on the 22nd of May, it's also close to the moon. Further around, Jupiter and Mars, but somewhat lower down, 12 degrees high. Uh, Jupiter should be visible because it's bright, magnitude minus 2.2. Mars much harder at only magnitude plus uh, 0.8. But Saturn will be, will be visible because it's a bit higher and it's a bit further out of the sunrise. So uh, they're all in the, in the morning sky. Neptune indeed is there as well. There's Neptune. This is the same chart but drawn for three days later. And... Uh, at that stage, the moon will be close. On the 25th of May, the moon is close to both Jupiter and Mars, but very low down, uh, only about 8 degrees high. 
Venus further around there. Venus is 6 degrees high at that time, uh, but very bright magnitude, minus 4.1, so Venus would be quite prominent. Uh, Neptune would be too faint to see in the morning twilight, but uh, uh, Mars may just be becoming visible then to the naked eye, and Jupiter should be clearly visible. And that's the 25th of May, uh, when the Moon will be close to those planets, like there, like that. At this time of year, you can start looking out for noctilucent clouds, which appear after sunset and before sunrise, in the, at the end of May and throughout June. And we had lovely displays last year. This was 2021, June the 23rd, and this is a picture I took from my back garden with an ordinary DSLR camera and a four second exposure. And once you see them, you will always recognize them. They have this ghostly blue-white color and this delicate filigree shape. So the time to look for them is about two hours after sunset in the northwest and about two hours before sunrise in the northeast from the end of May. Uh, there's no meteors this month particularly, apart from uh, the day, some daytime showers, which I only mention because we have a, a distinguished uh, radio meteor observer here, David Talibur, who might be interested to try and detect the daytime Arietids, 22nd of May to 2nd of July, or the daytime Zyperseids, 20th of May to 5th July. Not many it's, uh, it's uncertain. These, these details are very uncertain. We don't know quite where the, exactly where the radiants are, or the ZHR, so any new information about those is, is, is certainly, certainly useful and certainly welcome. So that's uh, all I have to say for this meeting. Uh, David, uh, could you mention our astronomy event on the 20th of May? Thank you for mentioning that. If not, I will. Yes. Uh, that's, that's the 20th of May. Um, I, I, yes, you go on, then. Okay. okay. Um, uh, David and I uh, are working with the Friends of Harrow World Recreation Ground. Um, you might know it by its previous name of uh, Box Tree Park. And uh, we're doing a series of what we call uh, stargazing events. And uh, on the 20th of May, Friday the 20th of May, we'll have the third of those events. Now, these events are designed for uh, people who have really no knowledge of uh, astronomy. So the main thing is that we've been pointing out constellations, any particularly interesting things in the sky, and uh, generally asking questions. Uh, for uh, complete beginners. But you are all experts, of course, but nonetheless, you're very welcome to come along. It will be on Friday, the 20th of May, at 9 p.m., and it will be at Harrow Weald Recreation Ground, which is um, uh, uh, on uh, uh, the high street, the high, ro uh, the high road at Harrow Weald, um, with the junction with the Uxbridge Road. And we will actually meet at the Park Life Cafe. So you're very welcome to come along to that. It's very close to the bus station. It's right adjacent, that's right, right adjacent to the bus garage at Harrow Wheels. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Do you do it's cloudy. Well, if it's cloudy, then obviously the event will be done. <laughs> and and, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll liaise with the friends uh, earlier in the day and give a go or no go indication to them. Okay, thank you very much. Any other announcements? Oh, I just a couple of very quick ones, sorry. Um, if you didn't see me on your way in, can you see me on the way out? Just make sure you signed your name in for me right. on the sheets. And uh, secondly, sorry, yeah. um, there's some magazines here that the members kindly uh, brought in. Just help yourself to any of these magazines that you'd like. Please take, take please take, and I've got a free gift, gift as well. Does anyone want a four-inch telescope? Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got a four-inch telescope. It's in the car. I'm going to give it away. A Russian towel. Tau 1, 4 inch from Vector on Equatorial Mount. Um, 
it's Russian, but it was made when Vladimir Prussian was in short trousers. <laughs> so if you want a four-inch telescope, or no one who would like one, see me. Um, just a, a, something that hasn't happened for uh, over a hundred years is happening next month. And that is that a, you, you showed a picture of the planets. <clears throat> Did you know that the planets will all be in order as from the sun in the morning sky during June and early July? Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, all the bright planets will be in order. And uh, so that might even be worth getting up early for. And the moon will be there in there at one point so you can have the moon, Mercury, etc., etc. So um, that's worth looking for. And uh, the next meeting will be at Christchurch <coughs> in Oxford. It will be an annual general meeting. And it will also uh, feature me again talking about Herschel and his telescopes. Did anybody go along to the Herschel exhibition in Slough? It's worth going to. Right. Anyway, it's on until the 14th. So you've got another few days if you want to go. It is quite a nice exhibition if you like Herschel. So I will be talking about Herschel at the next meeting. Okay, cool. nice to see you all and um, uh, see you again next month. Thank you. Thank you.